Israel urges UN Security Council to pressure Hamas on hostages. Israel's foreign minister, Israel Katz, urged the United Nations Security Council to exert pressure on Hamas to release hostages taken during the October 7 attack on Israel. The council discussed a UN report citing reasonable grounds to believe sexual violence, including rape and gang rape, occurred during the attack. Katz called for condemnation of Hamas crimes and imposition of sanctions, likening them to actions worse than those by al-Qaeda and ISIS. The Security Council, in previous resolutions, demanded the unconditional release of hostages and is currently considering a U.S.-drafted resolution condemning the attack and sexual violence. The U.S. ambassador urged council members to condemn Hamas, emphasizing the evidence presented. Hamas, accused of killing 1,200 and taking 253 hostages, triggered Israeli retaliation in Gaza, resulting in over 31,000 deaths. The Palestinian UN ambassador accused Israel of forcing displacement by rendering Gaza unlivable. Israel must change course in Gaza to keep international support, says Australia. Australian Foreign Minister Penny Wong criticized Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's handling of the war in Gaza, stating that it undermines Israel and risks losing international support. U.S. President Biden echoed similar sentiments, saying Netanyahu was hurting Israel more than helping by not adhering to the country's values. Wong emphasized the need for Israel to address the humanitarian crisis in Gaza to prevent further erosion of support. The conflict stemmed from an October 7 attack by Hamas on Israel, resulting in casualties and hostages. Israel's subsequent assault on Gaza has led to significant Palestinian casualties and displacement. Wong's remarks reflect a growing international call, including from staunch allies like Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, for Israel to prioritize addressing the humanitarian situation. UN Chief Antonio Guterres also appealed for a ceasefire, warning of further suffering for Gaza's population. However, Israel has maintained its stance to continue the war until Hamas is eradicated. Palestinians who work with Israel on Gaza aid are collaborators, says Hamas. A Hamas-linked website issued a warning to Palestinians collaborating with Israel to provide aid to Gaza, declaring that such actions would not be tolerated. The statement, attributed to a security official in Palestinian militant forces, threatened those assisting Israel with an iron fist, labeling them as collaborators. This response follows reports suggesting Israel's consideration of arming certain Palestinian individuals or clans in Gaza to secure aid convoys. The website condemned any collaboration with Israel and dismissed Israeli efforts to establish bodies to manage Gaza as a failed conspiracy. In Gaza, civil order is strained, and police are reluctant to provide security for convoys due to the risk of Israeli targeting. The issue of secure distribution of essential supplies has become a significant challenge. Meanwhile, Hamas official Basim Naim expressed a positive view of plans for a sea corridor for aid ships but emphasized the need to end the war, asserting that meeting Gaza's population needs is a guaranteed right under international humanitarian law. Naim urged the U.S. administration to use its influence to facilitate a ceasefire and compel Israel to open all land crossings for aid entry. Netanyahu, Hamas leaders are all dead men, insists on total victory. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu reiterated his commitment to achieving total victory in the war against Hamas in Gaza, despite ongoing ceasefire efforts. Netanyahu stated that Israel had eliminated the fourth-ranking Hamas member, likely Salah al-Arari, in a recent airstrike in Beirut. This admission suggests Israel's involvement in the attack. Netanyahu further indicated the targeting of Marwan Issa, the third-ranking Hamas official, in a subsequent airstrike in Gaza. However, the confirmation of Issa's death was pending. The Gaza conflict stemmed from an attack on Israel by Hamas and other extremist Palestinian groups, resulting in significant casualties. Israeli forces continued operations in Gaza, with reports of terrorists killed and arrests made. Criticism mounted against Israel's offensive due to the dire humanitarian situation in Gaza. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called for a ceasefire, warning against further attacks, particularly in the Rafah region. Despite international efforts, discussions for a ceasefire remained deadlocked. Relief efforts, including aid shipments from Cyprus, faced delays, with concerns over aid distribution and acceptance by Hamas. The U.S. military proposed setting up a temporary pier to facilitate aid delivery, but construction would take approximately two months.
Hezbollah says it stages drone strike on Israeli outpost in Golan Heights. Lebanon's Hezbollah group claimed responsibility for a drone attack on an Israeli air defense outpost in the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights. The attack, involving four drones, reportedly hit its target accurately, marking another operation in support of Palestinian militant groups in Gaza. Israel captured the Golan Heights from Syria in 1967. Since October, Hezbollah and the Israeli military have been exchanging fire along Lebanon's southern border, with Hezbollah firing rockets in support of its ally Hamas in Gaza. Israeli strikes have mostly targeted the southern border region but have recently extended further north. Last month, Hezbollah fired rockets at the same target in the Golan Heights. Hezbollah has used surface-to-air missiles and launched surveillance drones into northern Israel. The Israeli military confirmed two hostile aerial targets from Lebanon entering Israeli territory in the northern Golan area, falling in open areas. Israeli warplanes struck a Hezbollah military site in the border area of Jibain and another outpost in the Tebe area. Three fighters from the Lebanese Islamist militant group Jama Islamiyah, Hezbollah's ally, killed in an Israeli strike in southern Lebanon, were buried. According to medical and security sources, over 60 civilians and more than 200 Hezbollah fighters have been killed in Israeli shelling in Lebanon. Houthi missiles fired at ship in Red Sea, U.S. military says. Yemen's Houthi group fired two anti-ship ballistic missiles at a Liberian-flagged container ship, the Pinocchio, in the Red Sea. However, the U.S. Central Command reported that the missiles did not hit the vessel, resulting in no damage or injuries. Houthi military spokesperson Yehya Saria initially claimed they had targeted and hit the ship, describing it as American. The Pinocchio is a Liberian-flagged container ship owned by Singapore-registered company OMR-5 Inc. The Houthi group stated their intention to escalate military operations during Ramadan in solidarity with Palestinians in response to the Gaza conflict. Houthi attacks in the Red Sea have disrupted global shipping, leading to longer and more expensive routes. The US and UK have launched strikes on Houthi targets, and the group has been redesignated as a terrorist organization. Recent airstrikes hit Yemeni port cities, killing at least 11 and injuring 14, according to Yemen's internationally recognized government. CENTCOM conducted self-defense strikes, destroying an unmanned underwater vessel and 18 anti-ship missiles, deemed imminent threats to merchant vessels and U.S. Navy ships in the region. Ukraine's Zelensky says frontline situation better than in prior three months. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky stated in an interview with France's BFM television that the situation along the front of Ukraine's war with Russia was the best it had been in three months. He noted that Moscow's troops were no longer advancing after their capture of the eastern city of Avdiivka last month. Despite shortages of weaponry, Zelensky mentioned that Ukraine had improved its strategic position but warned that the situation could change without new supplies. He highlighted difficulties such as shortages of artillery shells, an air blockade, Russian long-range weapons, and intense Russian drone attacks. Zelensky also mentioned Ukrainian forces' efficiency against Russian aviation and their recovery in the east, with the advance of Russian troops being stopped. He described Russia's capture of Avdiivka, noting its strategic significance in defending the Russia-held regional center of Donetsk. Despite Russian troops seizing villages near Avdiivka, Ukrainian military spokespersons reported that Russian forces were no longer advancing, and Ukrainian troops had improved their position. Zelensky criticized Russian forces for leveling everything in Avdiivka through months of bombardments, rendering it destroyed. He also mentioned Russian superiority in long-range weapons, with an advance of 20 kilometers against Ukraine. Zelensky stated that Ukrainian forces had downed numerous Russian aircraft and were acting strongly in the Black Sea. Additionally, he highlighted the fortifications built by Kiev's forces over more than 1,000 kilometers of territory. Zelensky believed that a recent Russian missile strike in Odessa, while he and Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis were visiting, showed that Russian leader Vladimir Putin had lost touch with reality. He expressed concern about the missile strike, emphasizing the need for caution and the seriousness of the situation. Pentagon needs Congress to hand over $10 billion to replace weapons sent to Ukraine. The Pentagon has sent $10 billion worth of weapons to Ukraine that it still does not have the money to replace due to congressional gridlock according to a top Defense Department official. The funding to replenish the equipment sent to Ukraine is expected to be included in President Joe Biden's supplemental request, which provides additional aid for Ukraine, Taiwan, and Israel. 
However, the legislation has faced delays on Capitol Hill amid partisan disagreements. The senior Defense Department official warned that if the funding to backfill its stocks is not received, it will impact the U.S. military's own forces and readiness. The deficit results from the difference in the value of the equipment sent to Ukraine compared to the cost of replacing it, leading to a $10 billion gap. Concerns are growing about Ukraine running out of critical weapons, including ammunition and air defenses, while U.S. officials worry about shortfalls in U.S. weapons if the Defense Department cannot replenish its stocks. The $10 billion only covers the cost to replace munitions and weapons already sent to Ukraine and does not include expenses for the U.S. military buildup in the Middle East since the October 7 terrorist attacks by Hamas on Israel. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin has been reluctant to tap into the available $4.4 billion in authority to send aid to Ukraine without money to replace the weapons in the U.S. The Defense Department is urging lawmakers to pass the legislation, emphasizing the urgency of supporting Ukraine, which is low on ammunition and in need of assistance. Germany confirms UK talks on weapon swap to get missiles to Ukraine. Germany and Britain are discussing a weapons rotation, known as Ringtosh which would enable more deliveries of long-range missiles to Ukraine. Under the proposed arrangement, storm shadow missiles from the UK would be sent to Ukraine, while Germany would replenish its stockpile with Taurus missiles from Germany. This plan allows Germany to indirectly support Ukraine with long-range missiles without violating Chancellor Olaf Scholz's red line against directly providing Taurus missiles to Ukraine, fearing they could be used to strike Moscow. German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock confirmed the consideration of the Ringtosh idea citing similar deals done before to provide supplies to Ukraine. This discussion comes amid Germany's reluctance to provide Taurus missiles directly to Ukraine, as it could escalate the conflict. Lord Cameron, the British Foreign Secretary, suggested that Germany could set conditions on the use of Taurus missiles in Ukraine to prevent escalation. However, Lars Klingbeil, a co-leader of Scholz's SPD party, emphasized the importance of focusing on providing more ammunition to Ukraine rather than engaging in debates about Taurus missiles. Germany has previously engaged in weapon exchanges with countries like Slovakia, the Czech Republic, Slovenia, and Greece, providing military equipment to Ukraine in return for different types of weapons or military vehicles. Ukraine to lose significant ground to Russia without U.S. support, head of CIA warns. Ukraine faces the risk of losing significant ground to Russia in 2024, according to the head of the CIA, William Burns. This warning comes as Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky announced plans to construct 1,000 kilometers, 621 miles, of frontline defenses. The pressure on Ukraine to maintain its southeastern front line has intensified after Russian forces captured Avdiivka on February 17, marking Russia's first seizure of a city in nine months. A joint report by U.S. intelligence agencies highlighted that the war's deadlock is playing into Russia's strategic military advantages, shifting momentum in Moscow's favor. The report emphasized Russia's resilience as a capable adversary, benefiting from uncertainties surrounding Western military assistance to Ukraine. Burns stressed the importance of passing President Joe Biden's Ukraine aid package in Congress, warning that without supplemental assistance, Ukraine is likely to lose ground, possibly significantly, in 2024. Avril Haines, the U.S. National Intelligence Director, noted that Ukraine's retreat from Avdiivka exposed the erosion of its military capabilities. Top Polish leaders to visit White House, hoping to spur U.S. to help Ukraine more. President Joe Biden is hosting Poland's President and Prime Minister for talks at the White House, where the Polish leaders are expected to urge Washington to resolve its deadlock over replenishing funds for Ukraine amid the ongoing conflict in Europe. President Andrzej Duda called on NATO allies to increase defense spending to 3% of their GDP, emphasizing the need for collective responsibility in the face of Russia's military aggression. However, the Biden administration suggests that Duda's proposal may be overly ambitious at this time, emphasizing the importance of first achieving the 2% spending threshold. The visit coincides with the 25th anniversary of Poland's accession to NATO and highlights the nation's historic shift toward the West after decades of communist rule. The meeting also comes amid a standoff in Washington over Ukraine funding, with House Republicans blocking a bipartisan package that includes significant aid for Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, and U.S. border security. Duda and Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk are expected to emphasize the urgency of addressing European security concerns and the escalating threat posed by Russia's imperial policies.
The visit serves as an opportunity for Biden to underscore his commitment to the NATO alliance, contrasting with former President Donald Trump's approach. As fears deepen across Europe about Ukraine's fate, Duda and Tusk will advocate for advancing aid packages to support Ukraine and address the critical situation on the front lines. Russia is pouring billions into rail system upgrades as trade with China surges. Moscow is strengthening its trade partnership with Beijing by investing billions in two crucial rail lines, signaling deeper ties between the two nations since Russia's 2022 invasion of Ukraine. President Vladimir Putin has called for an increase in shipping capacity on the Trans-Siberian and Baikal-Amur mainline, railroads connecting Russia and China. Around $4 billion will be allocated to railroad infrastructure, with additional investments likely this month. Bilateral trade between Russia and China reached $37 billion in January and February 2024, with Chinese exports to Russia rising 12.5%. This momentum builds on 2023's record trade volumes totaling $240 billion. The emphasis on rail improvements may stem from challenges in Russia's sea routes due to Western sanctions on oil exports and trade restrictions with other key markets like India. The Russian Energy Ministry seeks priority for moving oil by rail, while plans for two new railroad connections with China by 2030 are underway. However, logistical issues persist, with railroads handling 13% less goods than their capacity in 2023. The planned boost aims to increase shipping capacity on the two railroads to 210 million tons by 2030, up from 150.5 million tons in 2023. U.S. will contribute $300 million to Haiti's multinational security mission. The United States is increasing its support for the Kenyan-led multinational security mission to Haiti, with Secretary of State Antony Blinken announcing a contribution of $300 million. This includes doubling the Department of Defense's approved support from $100 million to $200 million. The security mission aims to stabilize Haiti amid escalating violence, but the deployment timeline remains uncertain. Gangs in Haiti are likely to resist the foreign force deployment, as they perceive it as a threat to their control. Talks are ongoing, including discussions about establishing a transitional council to pave the way for elections in Haiti. The U.S. supports the creation of a broad-based, inclusive, independent presidential college to address the country's immediate needs and facilitate the deployment of the security mission. Additionally, the U.S. is providing $33 million in humanitarian assistance for Haiti. Haiti's government has extended a curfew in the West region to restore order and regain control amid the ongoing crisis. Philippines says China's maritime-related proposals run contrary to its interests. The Philippine Foreign Ministry has rejected several maritime-related proposals from China, stating that they go against the national interests of the Southeast Asian country. Among the proposals was one where China sought actions that would imply acknowledgement of its control over the Second Thomas Shoal. The Philippines deemed such a proposal incompatible with its constitution and international law. The rejection came in response to a Manila Times report quoting a Chinese official claiming that China's proposals to normalize situations in disputed areas in the South China Sea faced an action from the Philippine government. The Department of Foreign Affairs emphasized that the Philippines approached negotiations with China sincerely and in good faith, expressing surprise at China's disclosure of sensitive details of bilateral discussions. China reportedly presented 11 concept papers suggesting ways to manage the Second Thomas Shoal and address fishing issues in Scarborough Shoal, but the Philippine Foreign Ministry refuted the claims made by the Chinese official. India moves to implement controversial citizenship bill that excludes Muslims. India has introduced rules enabling the implementation of a contentious citizenship bill that excludes Muslims. The Citizenship, Amendment, Act, passed in 2019, offers fast-track citizenship to immigrants from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, excluding Muslims. The law applies to religious minorities facing persecution, such as Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists, Jains, Parsis, and Christians. Despite being praised by Prime Minister Narendra Modi, the bill faced opposition, with critics arguing it marginalized India's 200 million Muslim population and violated the constitution. Home Minister Amit Shah lauded Modi for fulfilling a commitment to religious minorities. Critics view the bill as part of Modi's and the Hindu nationalist Bharatiya Janata Party's agenda to promote Hindu nationalism, undermining India's secular ethos. Recent events, including mosque demolitions and clashes, highlight growing religious tensions under Modi's rule. 
The inauguration of a Hindu temple on a disputed site in Ayodhya further accentuated religious divisions in the country. India rejects China's objections to Modi's visit to Himalayan border state. India has dismissed Chinese objections to Prime Minister Narendra Modi's recent visit to Arunachal Pradesh, asserting that the northeastern state has always been an integral part of India. This response from the Indian Foreign Ministry came after China lodged a diplomatic protest over Modi's activities in the region. Modi visited Arunachal Pradesh to inaugurate infrastructure projects, including a tunnel aimed at enhancing connectivity to the strategically important border area of Tavang. While China claims Arunachal Pradesh as part of southern Tibet, India rejects this claim, affirming that the state is an integral part of India. India's foreign ministry spokesperson emphasized that objections to Indian leaders' visits to Arunachal Pradesh or India's developmental projects there are unreasonable and do not alter the reality of the state status within India. The two nuclear-armed neighbors share a border that spans 3,000 kilometers, much of which is poorly demarcated. Tensions between the two nations escalated in 2020 following clashes in the western Himalayas, resulting in casualties on both sides. Since then, both countries have bolstered their military presence along the border. Additionally, China heightened tensions by assigning Chinese names to 11 locations in Arunachal Pradesh last year. Shoals courts ASEAN nations in bid to cut China dependency. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz aims to strengthen economic relations with Thailand, Malaysia, and the Philippines to reduce Germany's dependency on China. Scholz will host leaders from these Southeast Asian countries in Berlin for separate talks, intending to diversify trade relations in Asia and enhance economic resilience through more diverse supply chains and raw materials partnerships. Despite efforts to pivot away from Beijing, China remains Germany's most significant trading partner, with German companies continuing to invest heavily in China. Scholz discussed expanding partnerships in renewable energies and green hydrogen with Malaysian Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim. Emphasizing the goal of diversifying economic ties globally. Meetings with Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos and Thai Prime Minister Sretha Thavison will also focus on raw materials partnerships, skilled worker cooperation, and free trade. Scholz also intends to discuss security issues in the Indo-Pacific region, Russia's war in Ukraine, and conflicts in the Middle East with his Asian counterparts. While seeking closer ties with ASEAN partners aids Germany in diversifying its business ties, the sheer size of China's economy, with over 1.4 billion consumers, poses a challenge compared to the 670 million people living in ASEAN countries. North Korea's Vice Foreign Minister in Mongolia on Rare Visit North Korea's Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs Pak Myung Ho visited Mongolia for talks with his counterpart Amartavshin Gambojaran, as confirmed by Mongolia's foreign ministry. This rare diplomatic trip by North Korean officials signals a potential shift in Pyongyang's approach to engagement following the pandemic related border closures. Discussions between the vice ministers focused on enhancing the friendly relationship between the two countries, as well as fostering international and regional cooperation. Pak also met with Mongolia's foreign minister Batsetseg Batmung during his visit. North Korea received invitations to participate in the 9th International Conference on Northeast Asian Security, Ulaanbaatar Dialogue, and the World Women's Forum later this year. Both sides agreed to take practical measures to resume collaboration in various sectors, including education and culture. The visit underscores the importance of Pyongyang's relations with Mongolia, according to statements from both countries' foreign ministries. North Korean state media KCNA reported PAC's delegation leaving for Mongolia without providing further details. FBI Director warns of dangerous individuals coming across southern border. FBI Director Chris Wray testified before a Senate panel at the annual Worldwide Threats Congressional Hearings, stating that dangerous individuals have entered the United States illegally at the southern border. Ray highlighted the diverse threats emanating from the border, including drug trafficking, and emphasized the FBI's seizures of significant amounts of fentanyl. While Ray acknowledged the presence of criminals entering the U.S., he clarified that there is no specific plot. He mentioned concerns about smuggling networks with ISIS ties and emphasized the heightened threat level from homegrown violent extremists. Jihadist-inspired extremists, domestic violent extremists, foreign terrorist organizations, and state-sponsored terrorist organizations. The intelligence chiefs also addressed topics such as the threat from China, conflicts in Gaza and Ukraine, and the potential influence of artificial intelligence on the 2024 U.S. election. House GOP leaders tear up Biden's new $7.3T budget proposal. 
House Republican leaders, including Speaker Mike Johnson, Majority Leader Steve Scalise, Majority Whip Tom Emmer, and GOP Conference Chair Elise Stefanik, criticized President Biden's proposed budget for fiscal year 2025, calling it a roadmap to accelerate America's decline. They highlighted concerns about reckless spending, inflation, and the national debt, which currently stands at over $34.5 trillion. Biden's $7.3 trillion budget plan includes tax increases on corporations and high-income households, aiming to generate roughly $5 trillion in additional revenue. The proposal also allocates funds for progressive policies like the American Climate Corps and the Green Climate Fund. House Republicans presented their own budget last week, aiming to cut $14 trillion in federal spending over 10 years, reduce taxes, and roll back Biden's green energy subsidies. While negotiations continue on funding for fiscal year 2024, discussions on funding fiscal year 2025 have begun, with disagreements over federal spending fueling division in Congress. Biden wants $4.7 billion emergency fund for border migrant surges. President Biden's budget proposal for 2025 includes a $4.7 billion emergency fund for border security, allowing the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, to address migrant surges. The fund would be utilized when the number of undocumented migrants crossing the southern border exceeds a specified threshold. Any unused funds would be transferred to Customs and Border Protection, CBP, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, and the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. However, congressional Republicans are unlikely to support this request, having already refused to fund a $13.6 billion emergency supplemental request for border security earlier. Both CBP and ICE are facing significant budget shortfalls, with ICE possibly needing to cut key operations by May due to a $500 million budget gap. Acting CBP Commissioner Troy Miller expressed concerns about the agency's weakened position if migrant numbers increase in the coming months. Biden's budget also seeks $405 million to hire more Border Patrol agents, funding to maintain ICE's existing detention beds, $1 billion for aid to Central America to address migration root causes, and nearly $1 billion to tackle the backlog of over 2.4 million pending cases in U.S. immigration courts. Additionally, there is a request for funds to hire 1,000 more CBP officers to combat fentanyl smuggling and $849 million for technology to detect fentanyl at the border. Senator John Tester called for funding for fentanyl detection technology after reports of scanners remaining in use due to Republican opposition. The budget also aims to ensure swift placement of unaccompanied migrant children with relatives and sponsors. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas emphasized the importance of the budget in meeting homeland security needs and protecting the American people. Pentagon says $1 billion planned for first two years of replicator. Deputy Secretary of Defense Kathleen Hicks revealed the estimated cost of the replicator program, aimed at countering China with thousands of drones by August 2025. The initiative is set to cost $1 billion, equally divided between fiscal years 2024 and 2025. Hicks emphasized replicators' dual purpose, not only to field drones but also to establish a process for future technological advancements. However, the funding for replicator remains uncertain with two potential options outlined by Pentagon Comptroller Mike McCord. The first option involves Congress including $500 million in the FY24 Pentagon budget, while the backup plan is a reprogramming request to shift funds within the budget. The FY25 budget already allocates $500 million for replicator, although the specific details remain classified. The Navy initially suggested its budget included funding for replicator but later issued a correction, clarifying that specific numbers were not discussed. The Army and Air Force did not provide details on their involvement in the program. The Pentagon's deliberate ambiguity about replicator's funding is attributed to security concerns, although some critics question the program's efficacy without clear funding details. McCord indicated that this stance on disclosure is likely to persist until Deputy Secretary Hicks decides otherwise. House Republicans release report seeking to undermine January 6 committee and star witness. The House Administration Committee's Oversight Subcommittee, led by Rep. Barry Loudermilk, Republican Georgia, released a report challenging key aspects of witness Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony regarding former President Donald Trump's actions on January 6. The report indicates that four White House employees did not corroborate Hutchinson's dramatic account, 
particularly her claim that Trump lunged for the steering wheel of his presidential SUV after being denied entry to the Capitol. While one employee described Trump's mood as irate following his speech at the Ellipse, Republicans argue that it is unlikely the other employees would have missed such a sensational story if it had occurred. House Republicans have sought to discredit Hutchinson, a former aide to White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, who testified before the January 6 committee about Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election. Hutchinson's account, detailed in her book and public testimony, has been central to the committee's investigation into the events leading up to the Capitol attack. However, the GOP report highlights inconsistencies in Hutchinson's testimony and questions the select committee's handling of her statements. In response, Hutchinson's attorney emphasized her client's commitment to truthfulness and rejected attempts to discredit her testimony. Meanwhile, House Democrats, including then-Chairman Benny Thompson and then-Vice-Chair Liz Cheney, maintain that Trump's actions on January 6 underscore his threat to democracy and the peaceful transfer of power. They criticized the GOP report as an attempt to deflect from Trump's responsibility for the violence on January 6 and his refusal to cooperate with the committee's inquiries. Trump asks to delay hush money trial until U.S. Supreme Court reviews immunity claim. Former President Donald Trump has requested a delay in his criminal trial on charges related to hush money paid to porn star Stormy Daniels. The trial, set to begin on March 25 in a New York state court, involves allegations that Trump directed his former lawyer, Michael Cohen, to pay $130,000 to Daniels to keep quiet about a sexual encounter before the 2016 election. Trump has pleaded not guilty to 34 counts of falsification of business records. His legal team is seeking a delay until the U.S. Supreme Court finishes reviewing his claim of presidential immunity in a separate case, arguing that the outcome is relevant to the hush money case. The Supreme Court agreed to hear Trump's argument regarding federal prosecution for trying to overturn the 2020 election, potentially delaying any trial by several months. Trump's lawyers claim that statements he made as president are immune from state prosecution. Prosecutors, on the other hand, have cited evidence of a pressure campaign by Trump in 2018 to prevent Cohen from cooperating with a federal investigation into the payment to Daniels.